from my experience of working in so many countries, I think that uh, non-Western countries can easily find a way how to reach agreements and peace. The terrorism that is being spread by the West, the colonialism, imperialism, is something absolutely fundamentalist. I may shock you now, but I really believe that Europe, which I am avoiding mostly in the last years because it scares me, I think Europe, and of course by uh, also definition, the United States, which is an offspring of, of Europe, is a fundamentalist place. It likes to talk about not being religious. Europeans don't go to church too often, they don't pray, they don't do uh, many rituals. But the mentality of Europe is strictly fundamentalist. They believe in their exceptionalism. They believe that by some divine uh, force, although they don't call it divine force, they are actually selected to judge the world, to tell the world what to think and what to do. And they are spreading propaganda, which is absolutely unbelievable and one-sided. So if you talk to most of Europeans, even those who, are, who mean well and they want to do good in a the world, there is still this superiority complex. They, there is still this uh, attempt to judge the other by the European eyes. Actually, your conference name is Meet the Other. I want to remind you that The Other is a book. It's a very important book by Polish uh, uh, anthropologist and the journalist, extremely brave man, who already passed away, Kapuczynski. So the other is uh, actually perhaps 90%, depends how you count it, if you consider Japanese honorary whites, as they call them in South Africa during apartheid, or who is honorary white, who is not. But the other is everything that is not white, and the few collaborating states with the West. The result is horrific. It's actually what uh, we began discussing at the beginning, uh, the uh, you know, ecology of war and all this, is that great majority of people live below the standard of living of the West, and perhaps one half of the population lives in war zones. This is not gonna change with activism. And I warn you, as somebody who really saw all this, who saw it really in detail, and who saw it very often, I got probably killed, almost like killed nine, <coughs> nine times. I'm now here sitting because I had a foot surgery after Afghanistan. So I go to all these places, I see it from, you know, I'm warning you, activism is not gonna change anything. This is uh, activism, very often is feel-good approach. Uh, and uh, it looks good, it feels good, but the world is in such agony and in such complex uh, set of problems that only resistance, the real resistance, can change the things. So what is the resistance really all about? Now we have uh, a group of nations that you may agree with, you may disagree with, but these nations are standing proudly and determinedly against Western imperialism. These nations include Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, South Africa, and until very recently, also Brazil, which I hope we will get back in October. So these nations actually, without being perfect, because nothing in this world is thanks God perfect, these nations said enough is enough. I know the people in all these countries, and I know that they received, the governments of both China and Russia received a message, clearly a message from the people, and it is do not any more step back. Do not compromise with the West. We suffered enough. China, during the period of so-called period of humiliation, had Beijing ransacked by France and England. It was totally divided, ruined. It's uh, 
Uh, development was uh, pushed back by centuries. Russia lost tens of millions of people through invasions from Scandinavia, from uh, France, from uh, Germany, from Japan, and after the revolution also UK and United States, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and so on. It is determined coalition of the nations which is willing and will be fighting if necessary. It is not a bunch of activists. It's a serious coalition against the West. Syria stood up with its socialist ideology and it fought. And it's winning together with Russia, together with Chinese advisors on the ground, together with Iran. Because more and more you travel, more you talk to people in Africa, in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Asia, more people realize that there is this horrible barbarism coming from the West. And that unless it's fought, unless the West is defeated and forced to stay where it is, on its asses, at home, and be a responsible member of the international community, there will never be a peace. You see, the problem, Carl Gustav Jung, your greatest psychiatrist, it will remember, it was not Freud. Freud is me, me, me psychiatrist. It tells you how to have sex and how to think about sex and how to masturbate. But Freud will not tell you really anything serious about your culture. Carl Gustav Jung, actually, in 1948, after the Second World War, defined European culture as sick, as pathology. He said, well, it's not only because of the Second World War, although it is partially because of Second World War, but you see what we did to Jews and what we did to everybody else in a Second World War, we were doing already to others for centuries. So he said, basically, we are sick. Our culture is sick. I agree with him. I don't believe that what we see now is about capitalism only. Capitalism, of course, is a horrific thing. And fundamentalist capital capitalism is even worse. That's what we are spreading. But it's not the only thing. Uh, and capitalism didn't begin with capitalism itself. It's a product uh, of the culture. And Jung was correct. You say Holocaust. Well, of course, we all know about Holocaust. And it is horrific what happened, horrific. But was it the first Holocaust that Germany committed? No. The first Holocaust took place in what is now Namibia, in West Africa, after, in the beginning of 20th century. But that's not known, even in Germany. The Herero and other tribes were wiped out. The success ratio of mass murder or Holocaust committed by Germany was 87%. They exterminated 87% of the people. They cut off the heads of the people who were still alive, and they brought it to the University of Freiburg and to two hospitals in Berlin in alcohol. Why? So they could analyze, they could figure out that and prove that the other is inferior to Aryan German race. So if somebody tells you that Germany reacted, the Second World War was because Germany was humiliated by or well, treaties uh, after the First World War. It's not. It was just continuing what it was doing in its colonies. Problem with Euro Europe is that Europeans do not understand. They do not want to understand what they have done to the world and what they are doing. They don't understand the outrage of Russian, Chinese, Iranian, people and to the oh, Latin American people and outrage of the people who are waking up finally in Africa and elsewhere. In Vietnam, in the city of Hue, the other day I saw incredible poster. It said, uh, uh, Egalité, Fraternité, Liberté uh, in French. And above that were images of Vietnamese people being tortured and raped by French during the colonialism. So the knowledge of this simply doesn't exist in Europe. 
it is still the, the colonialism is so, some sort of uh, you know distance distant tune the neo colonialism and what is being done to the world right now is seen as something very unpleasant and probably bad that can be fought with activism and all this but remember there are tens of millions of people dying right now because of that so you really cannot have peace in such a situation or you can have a peace but what is peace peace is for the west anything that actually does not attack western interests peace is not justice peace is not uh, a society of uh, a people who is fighting for their uh, egalitarian uh, rights or even for the rights to live decent lives. Peace is not the societies which uh, allow or is not something that allows the societies to take natural resources, justice and political system to their own hands. Every democratic system every single left-wing democratic system in Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia was either overthrown by the West or there were strong attempts to overthrow it. And now we have what? Those who survived, North Korea, Cuba. I know both countries very well. I visited North Korea, I made documentary film there, and Cuba is my basically uh, you know, it's a country where I became an internationalist. The West likes to use North Korea as a uh, ghost, as something that it can say, well, you want communism, this is what you will have. Well, let, let me remind you how it all happened. It's all part of the topic of creating perpetual conflicts. You see North Korea, and that's again Googleable, and you can, well, you don't have to trust me, you can just uh, uh, go to internet and try to find it. North Korea was richer and much more democratic than South Korea. South Korea was torturing people. It was uh, disappearing people during the brutal right-wing dictatorships and its economy was much weaker after the war. Then Soviet Union collapsed. They stopped uh, uh, honoring treaties. Uh, North Korea was totally isolated except for China that was trying somehow to help. Uh, embargoes, military buildup, Propaganda that it was beamed even across the border. If you go to Panmunjom, there are huge loudspeakers, uh, uh, you know, insulting North Korean government and system and all that. Uh, you know, all this had a great effect on the people and on the country. The country became, began, uh, you know, shrank. It began uh, defensive, and that's exactly what the West wanted. Cuba. How do you think a country whose leader had to survive 23 assassination attempts, whose airliners were blown from the sky with civilian casualties, whose clouds were bombarded so there is drought, whose restaurants and cafes are constantly under terrorist attacks from the West and from the worms, from gusanos, from so-called Cuban opposition, how can this country react? How would this country react if one restaurant after another would be blown up and uh, well, the, the government would face constant assassination plots and uh, SAS would be blown from the skies with uh, passengers on board? How would any country react? So anyway, that's um, what the West is doing uh, to anybody who is disobedient. Some countries crack in the process and they say, okay, it's probably better to negotiate, it's probably better to give up. As Nicaragua did under the horrible terror attempts, attacks, uh, when Contras uh, subsidized, uh, armed by the CIA, were raping children and uh, burning uh, civil villages. Uh, then uh, people like Ortega at the time said, well, look, I mean, seriously, I mean, we cannot continue like that. Our ideology, our beliefs is one thing, but people are dying. Ha, huh. well, they gave up. What happened? Absolute collapse of the country until the Sandinista came back to power. 
The only way is to fight. You cannot appease the West. So here we are, and uh, uh, all countries that are actually fighting against the West, and they are not willing to give up, be it Russia, be it China, be it Venezuela, be it Cuba, uh, or South Africa, such diverse places as that, with such diverse political and economic systems, all these countries are in direct confrontational course, on the direct confrontational course. And the reason is the West is afraid that it's going to lose its privileges, its dominant, privileged position in the world. It is not really something that they consider life and death. Well, it is life and death for the countries that they will have to face this uh, policy and this uh, kind of approach. Now, the other reason why the West is panicking is because our new media. You see, the thing is that the Brits were producing for the entire West their propaganda thing, because that's what they were doing since the era of colonialism. You see, I grew up in, so I was born in the Soviet Union. I was growing up in Czech uh, until I moved to New York. I was like 18 uh, when I moved to New York. I was absolutely brainwashed by the Western propaganda. I was living in Pilsen, which is a city next to Bavaria, in uh, what is now Czech Republic. My God, we were absolutely uh, hooked on Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, all this. So even in the Soviet bloc countries, people had diverse opinions. And definitely they were, they were uh, discussing the political issues. They were discussing them too much, and they were too indoctrinated and brainwashed by the West. That's why the whole system had collapsed. But here, in the most vicious, actually, global dictatorship, in the center of the most vicious global dictatorship of the, of the world, people are not doing anything to overthrow the system. There is no spirit of resistance. And then some of them are doing a little bit, you know, to feel good, so they maybe help the poor, or they, they maybe, you know, buy the lunch for refugees and all that. Well. This is much bigger issue than that. I mean, this is uh, because everybody in this, on this continent and in North America, believe it or not, although they have big disparities, everybody in the West is enjoying this system. Even the beggar in France has higher standard of living than lower, than lower middle class in the end. So nobody in Europe wants to change this. They want to keep this superior system. And if you would have real left here, which is internationalism, left wing is not the you know, French uh, railroad workers demanding higher salaries or uh, having seven weeks of vacations instead of six or uh, I don't know what. Left wing is internationalist. <laughs> And my publisher in France very correctly pointed out, if one French political party would really come with the program of the left, they would not get even 1%. But people would not vote for it. Because they want to give charity. Some people are you know, good people. They want to help. They want to do something. Um, but they would never give up the, the right to have these privileges. They would never really accept that the West should stop plundering the rest of the world. This is how the world is, unfortunately. And this is my, uh, actually, introduction. And it took me one hour. And I'm very sorry, because it was supposed to be 20 minutes. So then I would really like to see your faces now. And I would like to hear from you. And uh, let's have a dialogue. And I'm sorry for this long introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.